Our next speaker is uh, Tom Harris. Mr. Harris has 30 years experience as a mechanical engineer, project manager, and science and technology communication professional. Uh, for the past 20 years, he has been working with a team of scientists and engineers to promote a sensible approach to range of energy and environmental topics, climate change in particular. Mr. Harris is uh, regularly published in newspaper in Canada and in the United States and other countries as well. He is uh, often interviewed on radio and occasionally on TV. Uh, from 2009 to 2011, four sessions, he taught a total of 1,500 students climate change and earth science perspective. Uh, a second year course in the Faculty of Science at Carleton University. Uh, Tom? Thank you. <laughs> Merci, Renaud. Alors, je vais parler en, en anglais, malheureusement. Aside from that, my French is <laughs> not so good. However, I will practice for next year. <laughs> now, the whole energy topic has become kind of skewed. It's become like sort of a weird religion where wind and solar are considered holy and, and good sources of energy, and coal and oil are considered somehow evil. But of course, the world doesn't work that way. And what we're going to talk about today is we're going to bust some of the myths behind renewable energy. Because indeed, renewable energy in some cases is far dirtier and far more expensive than what you think. <laughs> OK. So the first slide I'm going to show you is what's called world climate finance. Now, this slide is very complicated. But I'll go back one more. There we go. This is how much is being spent around the world that has been tracked by the Climate Policy Initiative out of San Francisco. We're talking about roughly a billion dollars a day plus. Okay? Now, as John was pointing out the other day, it's actually probably a lot more. But that's the amount that they tracked. And if you actually go to the Climate Policy Initiative website, you can see how they break that down. And it's really quite fascinating. The United Nations wanted 50% of the money to go to adaptation, helping people adapt to real climate change, which of course happens all the time, and 50% to mitigation, which they think will stop climate change. But this is the actual ratio. If you actually have a look here, what you see on the far right is the net result. The mitigation, in other words, trying to stop climate change, is the big bar on the right. Okay, And the small part at the very top, in the far right, is the amount going to adaptation. Now, that's really a crime, because if you think about it, uh, what we're saying by this graph, it's 19 20ths is being spent trying to stop climate change that might someday happen, according to computer models that, as Patrick will probably tell us, don't work. But regardless, but 19 times more money is going to that possible future climate change than helping real people today. And when I was at the Copenhagen Climate Conference, the Africans were quite furious about this. They said, you know, my people need help today building wells, moving out of uh, areas that are changing agriculture, but we can't get the money because all the money is being spent trying to actually stop climate change. And where is that money actually going? Let's have a quick look here. This shows the primary source, and the big orange circle is private renewable energy. And that is by far the majority of where most of that money is going. Okay? And you, as you can see, it's a little hard to read, but it says $238 billion per year. Okay? And that's most of your billion dollars a day is going to renewable energy. So that's a huge amount of money that's going to that. And that's all they've been able to track. Okay? There's actually a good deal more. And as a result, we see things like this, which look very optimistic. We see the growth in wind and solar power are really zooming up. Okay? And this is what you hear all the time in the media, where you're talking about the uh, terawatt hours on the vertical axis and the year up to 2018. Now, that looks really great until you put it on a scale which shows how it compares with world energy use. <laughs> Steve, Steve Gorham created this slide. He's the head of the Climate Science Coalition of America. And he says in his presentation that he had to artificially enhance the solar to even make it visible. 
okay? <laughs> and what he said, and it was quite interesting, you can see his presentation on the web, is the total amount of wind and solar that's being generated is not even equal to the amount of increase in world energy use every year. So <laughs> when they talk about replacing you know, the rest of our conventional energy sources, it can't even replace the increase per year. The increase per year is about the equivalent of one United Kingdom per year. So when you put it on that kind of scale, you see, hey, it's not really growing very, I mean, it's growing quickly, but it's almost nothing. <laughs> and, and the fact that we've had these UN treaties has really not changed the picture much at all. 1988, the uh, FCCC, actually, and IPCC, those things were formed. And what we see here is the Kyoto Treaty in 1996. And by the end of this graph, 300,000 wind turbines have been installed, installed across the world. And yet, the total coal, gas, and oil share of world energy is just not changing. And there's some very good reasons for that, OK? I'll just first of all look at Quebec and Canada. Canada, as you can see, other renewables other than biofuels and waste is a grand total of 1%. So with all the billions that we're pouring into it, and we'll talk about the expenses in a minute, you can see it's practically nothing. This is Quebec's energy source for electricity. And it's quite amazing because you get almost all of it from an energy source that does not generate CO2 when it's operating. So you have to ask yourself, what's the point of wind and solar? If you're going to, I mean, if your concern is reducing CO2, then why would you bother to bring wind and solar into an energy mix that is already mostly no CO2? I mean, it's, it's really virtue signaling, as John would say. It doesn't really make any sense. So we have to ask, why has wind and solar not grown as fast as people say it has? Well, three things in particular. First of all, low intensity, OK? They're very spread out. You have to have enormous areas to get modest amounts of electricity, and I'll show you that. They're intermittent. Obviously, you don't get solar power at night, or you don't get much, actually, for except for six hours in the middle of the day. And of course, the wind blows or doesn't blow, and we'll talk about that, too. And it's very, very expensive. So on a clear day at the equator, you get about 1,000 watts per meter on the Earth's surface. In Europe, it's about 800. In Canada, something like 700. Only about 15% of it is converted into electricity. And after transmission line losses, what you end up with is this. A card table-sized solar panel can power one 100-watt bulb. OK, so what does it look like when you actually build a, a solar station? This is quite a big one. It's three quarters of a million panels in California. And let's take a look at what it actually produces and how big it is. Well, first of all, it's 100 times bigger than a typical natural gas plant. It's 1,500 acres. And what does it put out? Well, it puts out about 55 megawatts, which is about one-tenth the output of a medium-sized natural gas plant. Remember, that's 100 times bigger than the natural gas plant, and it puts out about one-tenth. And this is not, by far, the world's largest solar station. Here's one in India that covers 13,000 acres. You know, they actually had to move towns and all sorts of things to make this thing happen. Now, the interesting thing is that there was a study done in Germany and Switzerland that asked a very basic question. If you add up all the energy it costs to actually create solar panels and install them and maintain them and keep them clear of snow and everything else, and then, of course, decommission them, do you ever get back the amount of energy you put into them? Well, they found that in Germany and Switzerland, the answer was no, you don't. Okay, And they call that non, N-O-N-E, which is negative on net energy. And so Steve Gorham took that paper. As I say, he's the head of the, he's an energy expert, really excellent if you want to look him up on the web. I'll be quoting his book in a second. Um, he actually um, drew this line which showed where in North America the cut point is. In other words, below that line, you have a net positive contribution of solar when you add up all the costs of constructing and everything else. And above that line, you have a net negative. So in other words, if Canada tried to base our economy on solar power, we would have to import more energy because we'd be using, or the world as a whole would be using more energy uh, to actually create and install these things than they actually, actually create. 
So it doesn't sound very good. <laughs> Wind turbines are also extremely low intensity. They must be spaced, typically these big ones, at about 140 meters apart. And they typically require 200 to 250 times the area of a typical conventional power plant to give the same average energy output. And remember, it's only average, okay, because there are times when there's no wind. <laughs> now let's take a look at this. This is the largest offshore wind farm in the world. Okay, now these things look like they're pretty little, little toys, but no, <laughs> they're immense. They're huge things, okay? This is what they look like. And there is a total, I'll be able to give you the number in a second. There's a total of 175 turbines over 100 square kilometers, okay? So let's look at the output of this and see how does it compare with a typical station. Well, the output is typically, there's 100 square kilometers, about 233 megawatts, okay? And that is about one half the output of a typical conventional power station for 100 square kilometers. <laughs> Denmark has gone completely crazy on wind turbines. They've put up 5,000 of these huge wind turbines from coast to coast. You can see them plotted here on the map. You can walk from one side of Denmark to the other and never lose sight of a wind turbine. This is the highest density in the world. They have about one for every 1,000 people. And as we'll see when we get to the expense part of our presentation, it has had a huge impact on the cost of electricity in Denmark. By the way, you know, a lot of people don't want to live beside these things. I mean, I have a friend who lives in West Lincoln, Ontario, and he, she has a, a mentally challenged, physically challenged boy who's actually doing very well at this point. But the bottom line is that they were told they would not have a wind turbine put up near their home. In fact, the wind government put up a 62-story wind turbine 500 meters from their home. And I'll tell you, these are not pleasant to live beside. Infrasound goes right through the wall. This is not a good thing. Now, this is a very complicated graph, so I actually blew it up to the part that's most interesting. This shows what are, what are called capacity factors. In other words, a wind turbine might be rated at one megawatt, but how much, on average, does it put out? What percentage of that? The same thing with solar panels. They might be rated at a certain number of megawatts, but how much on average does it put out? And what you can see here is that for Canada, solar and wind together average about 26%. So they only really get, on average, about a quarter of what they're rated to give. Now, this graph, this is quite funny. Wind and solar power in Ontario are classified as base load power but their forecast capacity at peak, when we need it the most, is only 13.7%. In other words, only 13.7% of the electricity we need at peak, we can only rely on it for, for, for uh, wind and solar. And so one of the fellows I was dealing with, David Wojcik, who's a energy expert, he laughed and said, well, they shouldn't be calling gas or other sources to back up wind and solar as backup they should be calling them as front up. <laughs> because obviously the main energy source is not the backup. The main energy source is, in fact, you know, it's backwards. It's 80, what, 86.3% of the time you need to have the backup power. And the Ontario government puts this thing together, IESO, which shows the kind of capacity factor, in other words, how much you're really getting, um, towards meeting peak demand, because that's when it's most important. I mean, if it's the middle of the four in the morning and you're getting a lot of wind power and nobody's using it, that's not very valuable. So what this graph shows is the contribution of resources towards meeting peak demand uh, within a various seasons, okay? The blue is winter and the orange is summer. And you can see nuclear is almost 100%. Almost 100% of the time, nuclear is giving you just what it's supposed to give you. And natural gas is pretty good, bioenergy is not bad, but water is pretty good too. There's maintenance involved, so there's some downtime. Down but wind and solar, as you can see, are way, way down there. So when you hear about megawatts of electricity that are being generated, well, here's what's really happening, <laughs> okay? This graph shows how well it's being forecast, and it should say the next 18 months, so not eight months, that's a typo. Um, it's the projected Ontario solar capacity contribution to the grid at the time that we need it the most, at weekday peak, 
Okay, and what we see here is for several months there's none. None at all, and we'll see why in a second. And the best they get is 13.8, okay? 13.8% of the time, you know, that's the, the amount they're reaching. And capacity factor. And of course, that's one of the reasons why they don't get anything in January, because these are huge facilities, and typically there's not a lot of sun to begin with, and if they're covered with snow, well, you're not going to get much out of them. This is the projected wind capacity for the next 18 months, which interestingly actually peaks in the, in the winter, which is great, you know, because solar is zero. And you can see, however, during the summertime, it actually drops to 13.7%. Okay, so the capacity factors are very low. Now, this is interesting. It's not just us. It's all over the world that this is happening. The wind output is the red line. This is for the United Kingdom. The demand is way up here, okay? So the bottom line is that wind and solar cannot be relied upon because they're too intermittent. They also need huge amounts of backup power, okay? And it's because when there isn't any wind, you need something to take over. And in most jurisdictions, that's natural gas. Although in Ontario, it could be, well, in Ontario, it is natural gas. In Quebec, it can be hydro. But in Scotland, for example, Mr. Rupert Steele said that 30 gigawatts of wind power requires maybe 25 megawatts or gigawatts of backup power. So the actual reality of wind and solar is more like this. <laughs> That's what you, you see in the media. But the reality is you have to have all these conventional stations. You have to have enormous long transmission lines, which are not included in the cost when they give you cost estimates, as we'll show you in a second. Uh, and that is the reality, OK? Now, a graph like this is very deceptive. This is what you see on the Natural Resources Canada website. It shows the black is the average value for what's called the levelized cost of electricity. This is the cost of making electricity and the cost of you know, doing you know, the various things that are required to generate directly electricity. And these are only direct costs. They don't include things like the backup costs or the transmission costs or the subsidies. This graph shows that coal is actually pretty, you know, wind and solar are actually fairly competitive with coal, but they're hiding a lot of things. And in particular, they're hiding the subsidies. Okay, that's a big one. How much are the subsidies in Canada? Well, Bob Lyman did a paper, and he, his conclusion after listing many su subsidies was that we don't know. We don't know because, of course, there's subsidies at the federal level, there's subsidies at the provincial level, at the municipal level, all over the place. So nobody's actually totaled it up. In the United States, they have totaled it, and you can see in this graph, it's billions of dollars, all sorts of subsidies. But in Canada, we don't know. <laughs> now, we're going to try and give an estimate here as to what it probably costs, okay? Federal government will spend $2.4 billion over the next four years to promote the production and the use of clean energy, as they call it, especially wind and solar power. Now, I'm just going to quickly run through what are typical subsidies. I'm not going to put numbers on it because that's uh, a little too detailed, but I think it'll kind of make your eyes roll when you see the amount of subsidies that are going into wind and solar that are not included in the graphs on the NRCAN website. Okay, first of all, you have R&D funding. Then you have funding for demonstration projects. You have grants, contributions, low interest loans to suppliers or purchasers. You have preferential procurement practices. You have all kinds of tax incentives, credits, deductions, exemptions that are not provided to other energy sources. You have preferences granted through regulations. You have preferences with, with respect to of, above market utility rates. Okay, feed-in tariffs, things like that. And in fact, it's interesting that this particular fellow, Dr. Andrew Reed, he's an independent researcher that has written an excellent paper with the Fraser Institute. He says this, VRE, which is variable renewable energy, subsidies and other hidden costs would likely more than double the real cost to society for wind and solar power. Now, the... Uh, Energy Information Administration in the United States makes some effort to understand a comparison between the localized cost of energy uh, for these different energy sources. And they show that new sources are always more expensive than the old conventional sources. But they don't actually include things like 
the extra transmission costs by having wind turbines and wind farms a long way from where they need the electricity. When you add those in and you add in this new one, impose costs on other facilities. Because, of course, you need backup power. And what that means is you have to keep those natural gas stations or other stations on idle, in many cases, waiting to take over when the wind and the solar go down. So there's, they're going to be much less efficient. Now, there was a very nice analysis done by the um, Institute for Energy Research in America, americaspower.org. And what they tried to do was incorporate into the levelized cost of electricity the actual backup costs. Okay, what does it really cost? And they also didn't include all the subsidies to wind and solar power. And what they, what, uh, what they found out was this. They found out that existing coal, you hear often that we can replace coal, for example, with wind power. Well, look at the difference. New solar, new wind is ah, it's more, than more than twice as expensive as using the old stations. So in many cases, when they close down a coal station, because they're supposedly re replacing it with cheap wind and solar, and they close it long before the end of its lifetime, uh, that's actually a big problem because we would be getting that electricity at a much lower rate than we finally do. Now, if you actually look across the world, you get sort of a pretty good indication of what happens when you go nuts on wind and solar power. What you see here is the residential electricity price on the horizontal axis, and the vertical axis shows the wind and solar capacity, watts per person, okay? Remember, that's not necessarily the amount of energy that you're getting, but that's the capacity. What you see is as you have more and more electricity generated by wind and solar, you get higher and higher prices. And we're fortunately down here. But if we go <laughs> the way a lot of our governments want to go, we're headed up to the Denmark and Germany type electricity prices. Okay, so that is a pretty good proof positive that the government has to do something much better. And in particular, Pierre Desrochers, associate professor at the University of Toronto, he says this, electricity systems are complex and too often policymakers pursue renewable energy sources such as wind and solar without understanding their true costs. So, you know, Bob was mentioning to me the other day that in many cases we need to start putting price tags on the list of projects on the NRCAN website, for example. They list all these projects and they don't tell you how much they're costing. <laughs> and no one's totaled up all the subsidies. So who knows, maybe um, Dr. Reed is wrong. Maybe it's not double, maybe it's triple or quadruple the real cost. So the obvious conclusion is this. Governments must reevaluate the true cost to society of wind and solar, taking into account the backup that you need, the transmission lines that you need, and also the environmental costs. This might surprise you, but in some ways, wind power is the dirtiest power on the planet. And the reason is they use rare, earth, uh, rare earths that are actually mined in China in their super magnets. I attended a presentation at Carleton University from Dr. Elizabeth Anderson, a geologist, who looked into the environmental impacts of wind and solar. And she showed, for example, solar, and China's leading the world in the production of solar volta photovoltaic, that they make them under incredibly dirty conditions. Okay, and of course, everything has to be then shipped to another location. Wind power, in many cases, the electricity that is used to generate the materials to make the wind turbines are made in China with coal. Okay, and of course, their environmental controls are terrible. So indeed, the environmental impact of wind and solar is hardly what you'd call benign. One good piece of news is that the acceleration in the global investment in these things has actually stagnated. So you often hear from politicians, this is a great global opportunity. We have to accelerate and catch up with the world. Well, the world has already kind of backed off on wind and solar because they recognize that there are a lot of problems and they're very, very expensive. So in conclusion, no energy source is free. No energy source is completely clean or good or bad. Each has its costs. Everything pollutes the environment to some extent. You know, these wind turbines don't just fall out of the sky like manna from heaven. You actually have to make them and then leave fantastically big concrete uh, foundations in the ground when you take them down. In fact, Patrick was telling us last night that they're not going to remove these huge foundations. And of course, cement is a big producer of greenhouse gases. Solar and wind power are useful 
for some things. They're useful if you have application in remote areas where you're off the grid. Okay, so they're great for generating power where you wouldn't be able to connect to the grid. They're also useful for individuals who don't care that they're gonna be paying a huge price. Somebody who perhaps is an activist themselves and wants to pay 10 times the cost of electricity so that they can help stop climate change, oh yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so wind and solar are not useful for incorporation into Canada's base load power grid for these reasons. Low intensity, you need vast, huge areas they are intermittent. They don't give you power when you most need it. Okay, they give you a little bit, but we were looking at numbers like 13%. They're incredibly expensive, at least twice as expensive as what you hear. And the last one is unknown to most people, but they're environmentally destructive. Across the world, millions of birds and bats are being killed by wind turbines. The biggest threat is to bats because they don't actually have to be hit by a blade to be killed. If they go into the low pressure region near a bat, there's a sack in their brain that Patrick probably knows a lot more about than I do, that actually will burst and the bat dies. So across the world, there are millions of birds and bats being killed by wind turbines. My final conclusion is a little bit changed from this slide. Aside from funding research into improved methods for solar and wind power generation and storage, okay, I don't think the word storage is on here, Storage, that's something to continue to research, I think. Also, we should be researching methods of energy conservation. You know, there's all sorts of new zero waste stores, and those are, those are great things to be doing. But other than that, we should be canceling all subsidies and other financial support to wind and solar power. They just don't give us what we need, and they are incredibly bad for society in many ways. So, thank you very much. Uh